Okay, I don't want to take too much of your time tonight, but I did want to let you know about conversations that have been taking place um, over a number of days between myself, the town manager, town council, uh, the chair of the, uh, of the select board, the assistant town manager, the chair of your town meeting members um, association, and local health officials. So we've been having conversations about various contingency plans, as you might imagine, for town meeting and various options, knowing that it's a very fluid situation, and obviously there've been, there's been a lot of information available today that changes the situation somewhat. And so we are um, looking at ways to conduct a meeting that is um, within legal boundaries, our responsibility as the legislative body, that is sensitive to uh, the characteristics of our particular membership, which tends to skew um, a little bit older, and also skews towards folks who are employed by organizations that have placed restrictions on attendance at large meetings. Um, there are conversations taking place at the state level among town councils and the attorney general about various options that might be available to us, emergency legislation that might provide a path forward. Um, so I just want you to know those conversations have been taking place on a daily basis. We will continue to have those conversations and uh, we will uh, start to put together a plan that is, you know, that speaks to those to those concerns. So I just want you to know that that's ongoing. I know that's a little frustrating that I'm not laying out for you a plan, but um, I think that all of the concerns that you all have expressed um, have been represented in the conversations that have been going on for a while now. So I just wanted to let you know, and we'll keep you posted. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, we will get started with the information session. I believe first up is Ms. Fenelosa for the uh, CPA. While she's getting the screen up, uh, good evening, everyone. My report tonight is going to be a little briefer than normal because there is a crowd of important people behind me waiting to take the podium. You will get a complete picture of our finances when I give the report at town meeting. You will also um, be, able, be able to read about all of our projects in our report in the Brown Book, in the Capital Expenditures Book, in the Appropriation Book, and in the TMMA Information Book. So by the time you get to town meeting and our pro projects, you're going to know everything you ever wanted to know about them. Um, but tonight is the night to ask your questions about the projects. We have representatives from most of the project sponsors in the audience, and to the extent that I can't answer them, uh, we'll let them take the podium. They will be in front of you at town meeting. Before we, before we go to ta get to, even get to town meeting, this is the, uh, our, the balance of our uh, community preservation account. Our available balances are almost $5 million. This is higher than we normally expect to have in the account, but last, last fall we had some, uh, or last, I'm sorry, last town meeting, we had several large projects that we had expected to go forward, not go forward, which left us with a, a significant cash balance. By the end of uh, town meeting, if you approve all of the projects that we're recommending uh, and add to that our, our debt expenses and our administrative expenses, we will have, again, about uh, an $11 million balance. But, no, at the, I'm sorry, I'm at the wrong, that's the wrong. Uh, at the ending balance will be about $5 million. Uh, which again is more than we, tr we typically have budgeted for, for our, our fund balance, but there are still very large projects in the pipeline, and I'll tell you about some of them tonight, uh, and there'll be more discussion in our reports. 
But let's just dive into the actual projects so that we can get through them all in the time that I have and be able to uh, answer your questions. Uh, the first project you've seen before, Archives and Records Management for $20,000. Every year the for a number of years, the town clerk has asked us uh, for funds to conserve and preserve our earliest his uh, historic municipal documents. This year, the uh, town clerk is asking for money to preserve colonial town warrants, the 1873 tax book, police department records from 1874 to 1909, and valuation books from 1916 to 1918. This article will be uh, included on the consent agenda unless any of you want to take it out of there. Any questions on this one? Good. Margaret Lady Lexington. I hope you noticed her when you came in the door. She's right outside uh, in, next to this Ellen Stone room. The painting has been hanging on the wall since 1928 and is, in ba is badly in need of restoration and conservation. This article proposes $9,000 uh, to restore uh, and preserve the painting. Uh, it is believed that Lord Lexington is the, uh, the namesake of our town. There is sketchy research on it, but there is some research that would indicate that uh, we, we are named after Lord and Lady Lexington. No questions? Okay. Battle Green Master Plan, Phase 3. Last year we came before you with uh, a much larger project to complete Phase 3 of the Battle Green. Because at the time we thought we didn't have enough money, we asked them to postpone some of the project until this year, which, which um, facilities did. This is the, so this is the second half of a project, um, and this will complete the master plan that was first recommended, that first recommended uh, renovations to the Battle Green in 2011. This will be the end. Construction of site amenities, pathways, monument restoration, lighting, installation, and historical landscaping. We had expected a large conservation uh, proposal. It did not come through. Uh, it may come through by the fall. It may not come through at all. But that's why this will be indefinitely postponed. When we, when we filed for the warrant, uh, it was still very much alive. The Daisy Wilson Meadow Preservation. Uh, this will preserve approximately five acres of the meadow at Daisy Wilson. A meadow. Uh, conservation has been uh, going from meadow to meadow around town to restore our, the meadows in our conservation land. Uh, conservation manages at least 65 acres of upland meadows, and woods and invasive plants are taking over uh, because maintenance has been deferred over the years. So the meadow restoration program is bringing back our meadows uh, to their original state. We have done past projects at Hennessy Field, at Joyce Miller's Meadow, and at the Wright Farm Meadow. And speaking of the Wright Farm, uh, conservation has also asked for additional planning funds. Do you have one for, for this? Okay. Uh, the Wright Farm Site Access Planning and Design, $69,000 to engage a consultant to develop a site access and design plan for the conservation land there. Uh, this farm was originally acquired in 2012 and 2015 for conservation and community housing. Some studies have been completed. This will, complete, this will continue and complete the long-term planning process for the site to accommodate all the needs and wants uh, for the town at the, at the location. Uh, Andre Radulescu, Bano Precinct 8. So my, house is, my, my question is about the uh, uh, Lexab affordable housing. What's the status of the building? Is it uh, in use? It's not house? in use yet. It's close. Uh, um, I, they have been rehabbing the building over there for, is Bob or? No, I don't see anyone from Lexab here. Uh, 
I drove by it yesterday, actually, and uh, it looks like it's close. I don't know what the interior looks like, but they're, they're done, but they have uh, secured the, I think they've completed the exterior, and I believe they're working on the interior now. Well, so I, we I'm can find out by town meeting, though. I'm waiting to hear more by town meeting because we allocated $200,000 uh, for, for affordable housing back I'm in. I'm sorry, I can't. We allocated two hundred thousand dollars back in two thousand fifteen to turn this into affordable housing, and um, many years have passed. So I'd, I'd like to know whether this was completed or not. Okay, we'll Thank find you. out. Thank you. No one here from Lexington. Okay. Uh, like conservation, recreation is going around the town and upgrading their facilities. This. Uh, is part of a athletic facility lighting project uh, at, at the Gallagher Tennis Courts, Center Basketball Courts, and the Town Co Complex as a part of their lighting project across the town. Uh, this is a supplemental request to complete the lighting project began last year. Last year we uh, implemented lighting, improved lighting at the center softball and baseball fields and some preliminary work for the tennis courts. Tom Scheipel, Precinct 9, quick question. Um, it looks like the previous project came in quite um, high over the, the expected amount. The bids were quite high. And I'm just wondering what kind of a um, uh, study has been done to get a better sense of how firm the, how realistic this number is, the 450,000, or if we should expect again <clears throat> bids to come in much higher. We do not expect it to come in much higher. Um, I believe that there were some issues in the procurement process that had been resolved at, at the select board level uh, and the town manager's level that so that this cannot happen again, that this will be sufficient funding to uh, complete the project as it, as it was presented. Is there anyone here from recreation? So just so I understand your question, um, in terms of this funding, we just recently received the updated um, quotes for the remaining work, and we're within budget, and there is a small portion of money left in the um, article from last year that wasn't enough to complete another portion of the project. So the portion of the project that was complete with the original ask was center one and two, replacement of all the lights in the conduit, the installation of the transformers for the whole complex, as well as the conduit work for the, the tennis courts is complete around all 10 courts. But the remaining funds, which I believe is a, on or about 50,000, I think we're working on that right now, plus this would give us enough to complete the remaining work. Recreation also has a program to, of hard court resurfacing of our tennis courts and basketball courts. Um, the courts at the Valley Tennis Courts, which is off Valley Road, which is off Bedford Street, um, were last resurfaced in 2008. Uh, we're now asking for resurfacing, painting, and striping of the hard court surfaces and the installation of a permanent bike rack at the site. Also on recreation's agenda, a park and playground, playground improvements program, this time at Sutherland Park. This will renovate the park um, to ensure that the uh, equipment is in compliance with safety and accessibility requirements and create an accessible route to dugouts and ins installation of a bike rack. Also, park improvements at athletic fields. Three fields were targeted this year, Harrington, Bowman, and Franklin. Field renovations, including excavating infield areas, laser grading, installation of in-ground systems, accessibility. Part of a multi-year program to address safety, playability, and accessibility at our athletic fields.
Now he gets it set up. <laughs> uh, Parker Meadow Accessible Trail Construction. Uh, listed under recreational resources, it's really a conservation commission project. One of the more exciting things I think that's happening. Uh, we are now in the construction phase of the universal accessible, universally accessible passive recreation trail system at uh, the Parker Meadow. Phase one design funds were approved in 2014. This will implement those recommendations in the design. Lexington Housing Authorities, Greeley Village. Uh, Greeley Village was built in 1968 with 100 units of affordable housing. We, in the past, we have funded rehabilitation of many of the buildings there, the windows, the roofs, the siding, the doors, uh, and the construction of four new accessible units uh, in 2012. This year, this will fund the, pre the preservation of Greeley Village's community center, uh, a place with TV, Wi-Fi, kitchen, laundry services for the residents. Uh, both floors are, are completely accessible, and uh, the building is in need of preservation. The porch is falling, the rails are falling off, so it's no longer safe for the residents. Vine Street. Uh, you may remember the Leary Farm that was acquired in 2009. Uh, 14 acres, 30,000 square feet of it was carved off for a housing, for a housing facility. Uh, an ad hoc committee was appointed in 2010 that re issued recommendations in the following year to build five to six units in one, one or two structures with Lexhab as the developer. Uh, the existing farmhouse was torn down and now they are looking to see what we can put on the site for housing. Part of the funding here is to uh, explore the possibility of moving the Hosmer House to the site and incorporating it into the larger development. The LexHab anticipates a uh, construction cost that would come in next year at about three and a half million for design, construction, and contingencies. This is our debt service. Uh, the first three items, the Wright Farm Acquisition, Community Center, and Cary Memorial, these are all being paid on schedule. The first two will be fully paid in fiscal year 24, and the, last, and the third will be paid in fiscal year 25. We are going to pay off the center track next spring. We had a windfall from the, um, from the uh, state this January, we, were, we received an additional $503,000 that we did not expect to get uh, from a budget surplus, from our share of the budget surplus. And so on the advice of our assistant town manager for finance, we're going to take that money and prepay the debt uh, so that it will be fully retired next spring. And you had a question? Yes, uh, I have a question about the previous uh, slide, uh, 116. Uh, I'm vines. sorry, you, for some reason I'm not kidding. I, I have a question about 116 uh, Vine Street. Okay. Um, so you mentioned Hosmer House. Yes. My question is, uh, has the town looked at uh, the possibility of private purchase of, uh, of the house? The town is exploring all kinds of, of, of options. Uh, there, the select board has a, repre has a representative who is in charge of exploring what to do with the house, and Lex has stepped up to the plate and said, well, maybe we could use it, and the town said, let's find out if it works. But it's not the only alternative, and if, it's, if it doesn't work, the Hosmer House will probably be uh, moved aside to make room for the police station and preserved in situ until it can, until a realistic uh, use can be found. I personally hope, and I'm not rep representing anyone when I say this, uh, that if it were to go to a private owner, that it would be placed under some sort of preservation restrictions so that the house would survive and would not be demolished. Thank you. I think we talked about the debt. Were there any questions about the debt? No. And then the last project, uh, our administrative expenses, which we 
uh, bring to you every year, uh, asking for $150,000 to pay all of the behind the scenes expenses that we do incur in connection with all of these projects, um, legal fees, uh, coalition dues, and this was really important because it was the coalition who managed to get us that budget surplus and also to increase our deed fees, which will bring our state match uh, to well in excess of what we've been getting over the last few years. Appraisals when, we, when, we look, when we're looking to buy properties. And any money that we don't spend from this, uh, from this appropriation goes right back into the fund, so it will be available for other projects. Where'd you go? I don't know where the last one went. Do you have another, do you have a last page? It's what? It, th that's the last page. Yes. Um, yes, you had a question. Steve Heinrich, Precinct 3. Um, can you talk about a little bit about what we, what we got from the state this past year in terms of match? Yes, I can. I just, I, I was just mindful of the people just, in the audience, but I still have 10 minutes, so I can, before they get the hook out. Uh, we had originally budgeted, let me find it, we had conservatively estimated that we were going to get an 11.57 um, match based on, uh, based on revenues at the, at the uh, state registry. We actually received 14.6% in November, um, which would have given us 717,000. And then the additional 500,000, 503,000 was awarded to us with supplemental funding in January. So this raised our percentage uh, up to 24.8%. These numbers are all in our report. At the same time, though, the legislature did another thing that is wonderful, and that is that for the first time since CPA was enacted in 20, about 2000, uh, the state has raised the fees that are collect collected at the state registries of deeds uh, that go directly into the CPA trust fund. Um, and as a result of the, it's, the uh, fees have gone from $10 to $25 for municipal liens and certi certificates, and $20 to $50 for most other documents, including the recording of deeds. We will estimate next year, we will estimate two months of, um, of state match at the old rate and 10 months at the new rate. The first full year of new rates will be in October 21, but we expect a, sub a substantial increase in the amount of money that we're getting from the state. And I apologize for not saying that earlier, but I was, again, mindful of the time and the guys waiting in the, in the um, back room here. Any other questions? All right, well, there'll be, plan there'll be other opportunities to ask, and as I said, you'll have lots of information about, about our projects in the various reports that you get. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Fenelosa. Uh, running a little bit ahead, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Malloy, are you ready? Well, good evening. Um, I'm going to do a <clears throat> brief high-level overview of the fiscal year 21 recommended budget and financing plan. If I can, where am I pointing this? Oh. Sensitive. Um, so to go over the uh, financial management, the town in 2019 reviewed and reaffirmed the following fiscal guidelines with the select board the financial committees and the school committee. First, the uh, use of set-asides and the use of reserves, including the capital stabilization fund, the general stabilization fund, and other post-employment benefits that we've been setting aside in the past. Uh, the use of the revenue allocation model in developing uh, the town and school budgets to equally divide the new revenues that are coming into the town. The 
use of one-time revenues for one-time expenses and transitioning free cash out of the annual operating budget. In fiscal year 19, uh, we were supplementing the general fund budget with $3.5 million of free cash. In fiscal year 20, we reduced that to 2.8 million and we're reducing it to 2.1 million in fiscal year 21. <clears throat> We are looking at continue to utilizing uh, the full proposition two and a half levy limit and taxing to that limit. And then uh, we are, we've begun in fiscal year 21 with the prioritized capital improvement project program where we now rate all of our capital projects so that they're the highest rated projects of those that are being undertaken first. And in fiscal year 21 is the first year where we have some projects that have fallen off of the five-year plan because they simply weren't rated high enough. And one of the other things that we're doing related to um, phasing out the use of free cash to supplement the general fund operating budget is that we're now beginning to use that extra free cash instead of supporting the operating budget, we're using it to um, pay for cash capital which is reducing our debt service budget and will long-term have a benefit to the town by reducing our overall interest cost. One other thing that's somewhat limited or uh, related to those also is that we're also um, taking a look, well, we're not taking a look, we're doing it in fiscal year 21. We've started to build the long-term water and sewer capital cost into the operating budget of the water and sewer departments. What we do right now is we borrow about uh, $3.5 million a year. And what we're planning on doing is replacing water and sewer lines as their useful life, which is a 100-year expected useful life. And so we're going to be forever replacing one one-hundredth of our water and sewer lines. And in order to do that, it costs us about $3.5 million a year. And what we've been doing is borrowing that money. So what we're doing is over the next 10 years, at one-tenth of that amount per year, we're be beginning to build that into the operating budget so that 10 years from now, what we'll actually see is a decrease in that capital cost by about 20% by eliminating 10 years of interest on $3.5 million a year. Then on the general fund um, revenue sources, there's obviously a pie chart there that has the percentages. You can see that uh, property tax remains at about 81%. We're looking at about a $7.5 million increase in property taxes in fiscal year 21. Approximately 234,000 in state aid as an increase and an increase in local receipts of just under $200,000 and a use of our available funds of about $630,000 uh, as far as an increase in fiscal year 21. This chart shows two things. It shows our total revenues um, year over year from 2008 through 2021. So you can see the total growth. And then the line is the percentage growth each year, as you can see. We had relatively stable revenue growth between fiscal year 09 and fiscal year 13, and then we had a spike in fiscal year 14, which was created by um, a number of different things, including uh, a collection on some uh, past due taxes that were very large. So we had a big boost that year, and then we had sort of some up and down years between fiscal year 15 and fiscal year 19, fiscal year 19, 20, and 21, as you can see, our overall revenue growth, growth has been uh, fairly flat. So to go over the um, select board's budget priorities and principles, uh, we're planning on continuing to move the construction of the police uh, station project forward. Design will be completed and a construction recommendation is planned for the fall special town meeting followed by a debt exclusion vote uh, shortly thereafter. The Board of Selectmen were having discussions about whether or not uh, the building would remain in its uh, current location on Massachusetts Avenue or whether or not um, a location at uh, 173 Bedford Street would be a better location where we could build new. But as we've worked with the Historic District Commission and we've worked through some design issues, we believe we can actually do the project at the current location, which we believe is a better location overall. Um, 
The second item is on the pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicle safety on town roads. Uh, we have new sidewalks uh, planned in two locations, some existing sidewalk improvements, town-wide signalization improvements, and surface street improvements. The two uh, locations that we plan on doing sidewalk projects are on uh, Westminster from Lowell Street to the Arlington Town Line and on Massachusetts Avenue from Crosby Drive to uh, the 128 Bridge. We are uh, looking at doing the cemetery building reconstruction. It's a project we've been talking about for a couple of years and we did a year-long study on whether or not um, that would include a crematory, and the, the, we had a study committee that filed a report at the last town meeting, and the decision was made to go forward with just a cemetery building. And so this budget includes funding, a funding request for the construction of the new um, cemetery offices and equipment. We're continuing on the community mental health initiative and working with a co in cooperation between the uh, town and the school departments and we have a contract with William James Interface, which is part of how that program has been working. On transportation, we're uh, funding pilot programs to improve transportation delivery services. We're looking at doing a few different pilot programs with the MBTA as well as our own service to see whether or not we can uh, figure out some better routes on some of uh, the MBTA and our Lexpress uh, trans transit programs. We've also budgeted additional hours for the transportation manager to begin expanding and focusing a little bit more on transit improvements. We are um, continuing to fund the sustainability director in the fiscal year 20 budget. We funded one half year of a sustainability director. The fiscal year 21 budget includes a full year funding for the sustainability director as well as $25,000 for funding sustainability projects and using a seed money for any grants that that person may be, may be able to achieve. And then the uh, final item is that the school department completed a um, school facilities master plan in the past year and what we're looking at is doing a town um, facilities master plan that would work in conjunction with the school facilities master plan to better inform all of the policy makers going forward on when we need to be doing projects and to help us plan in the future. This uh, chart and table show the general fund budget by cost center. Uh, you can see that the education budget is increasing by about $5.2 million, which is about a 4.5% increase. Our shared expenses are increasing about $2.2 million, which is a 3.6% increase. And then the municipal departments are increasing by about $1.3 million, which is a $3.2 million increase. The overall budget is increasing by 4% or $8.68 million. The chart on the side just shows the relative percentage of the school department, which is shown in blue. Uh, it's going from 53.5% to 53.7%. Those shared expenses between the town and the school departments are going from 27.9% down to 278 And then the uh, light gray bar at the top is the municipal departments, which are going from about 18.6% of our total spending down to about 18.4% of our total spending. Uh, this is on the municipal operating budget. Uh, the pie chart on the right-hand side basically shows the overall breakdown of all of our departments or our major departments and major functions. You can see the education department is uh, clearly, as most of us know, is the largest portion of that, followed by our benefits, which are about 17%, and then all of the other departments uh, make up of a various amount of uh, the percentages there. The employee benefits um, are broken down on the table on the left-hand side. Our retirement costs are about $6.7 million in fiscal year 21. It's estimated that by fiscal year 25, we'll be fully funded in our retirement system. We'll see a large portion of that drop off. The employee insurance, which includes health insurance, dental insurance, life, and Medicare, which is 1.45% of our total salaries, um, is included in the employee insurance line item. And then unemployment and workers' compensation uh, were self-funded, and those numbers are shown on the table. The 
This is on our capital improvements, uh, some highlights on capital improvements and debt management. On fiscal year 21, we're looking at moving forward with the Westview Cemetery building, pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicle safety activities at $3.8 million, a new roof at the Bridge Elementary School at $2 million, of which we have applied for the MSBA's program to do uh, the building envelope. And if we are successful in that, approximately 30 to 35 percent of the total cost would be paid for or reimbursed by the MSBA. And then we also have town and school technology at $1.9 million. On uh, debt management, we are looking to appropriate $3.5 million, $3 million from the Capital Stabilization Fund for exempt debt as anticipated during the override for the fire station, LPS, the Lexington um, Children's Place, and, um, and Hastings Elementary School. Uh, and then we are looking at adding $1.77 million into the Capital Stabilization Fund from free cash and from the tax levy. So this chart shows our reserve fund balances. You can see in fiscal year 10, they were just under $10 million. At this point, they're a little over $50 million. The town has done a lot of work over the last several years to plan for capital stabilization and the other post-employment benefits as well as um, maintaining our general stabilization funds. So on this chart above, the uh, blue bars, which are relatively the same each year, are the special uh, education stabilization fund. The orange bars are general stabilization fund. The gray bars are the um, OPEB or other post-employment benefits, which covers the long-term liability of health insurance for public employees once they've retired. You can see that number is growing. We are increasing that on an annual basis, and it includes the interest um, that's accrued on that account. It stays with the account. And then the yellow is the capital stabilization fund, which you can see has been built from fiscal year 2013 until this year to be really one of our largest um, stabilization funds. And that's uh, really being built in anticipation of uh, some large projects in the future. And the final um, chart here, uh, page here, is the uh, future considerations. Um, the large capital project that I just mentioned is the very first bullet there. We understand that our first um, biggest project will be the uh, potential Lexington High School project, either renovation or reconstruction with a brand new school. The second is managing our increasing operating expenses and align that with our revenue growth. One of the issues we struggle with every year is, even though we have a, a nice revenue allocation model, is making sure that that model fits within the school's needs as well as the municipal side of government's needs. And then the impact on uh, commercial development and relieving the residential tax burden, which is one of the select board's um, main priorities over the next couple of years, and we're going to begin um, working more on that as we continue to work on Hartwell Avenue. And then finally, maintaining the operating budget within the confines of Proposition 2.5 and, and not proposing uh, operating budget overrides. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Hi, Cynthia Ahrens, Precinct 3. Um, there's some great graphs in there, lots of color, which is better than the brown book. Can we have this made available? Yes, we can, um, we can put this on the website. Great. Thank you. Steve Heinrich, Precinct 3. You indicated um, that several projects had fallen off the uh, five-year plan for capital. I was wondering if you could say a few words about about that, or do you prefer to hold that until later? Um, I, I could. I have to actually open the page. Do you have the page? Thanks. Go down here. Okay, so the projects that actually were rated low enough that they uh, dropped off were, for a number of years, we carried a uh, parking lot consolidation and repaving um, project for 1.6 million dollars, which is for the parking lots that are behind the library. There was a pro, uh, project proposed that would 
work with the private property owners in that area, either acquire easements or acquire real estate, and then realign and redesign all of those that parking back there. That was um, uh, low enough rated that it did not get included. And then additionally, we had some cemetery projects, some improvements at the cemetery, including a columbarium that was rated very low, but we anticipate seeing that back over the next couple of years as we finish the cemetery building project. Uh, street acceptance, which we didn't have one this year, so it was rated very low. And then uh, public grounds irrigation improvements was rated too low to be approved. And then staging, uh, we were looking at uh, 55, we were, was requested to um, budget $55,000 for um, some additional staging for the Patriots Day um, event. And so those projects were all rated low enough that they dropped off. Uh, John Bartenstein, Precinct 1. I just have a question about the chart you showed a minute ago about reserves, um, and in particular the OPEB fund. Uh, the, the, I, the OPEB fund is pretty much equivalent to the pension fund, and the pension fund is not included as reserve. OPEB is. It's also a trust fund. And I wonder whether it's consistent with other reserve funds like capital stabilization fund to count that as a reserve. I don't have an answer for that. Um, the OPEB, the way the OPEBs have been set up as a as a trust fund, um, the way we can do it through the, the state law, uh, I believe they're just considered separately. I, I I'm, I'm not quite sure what your question is. Well, I guess I'm just thinking that in terms of building our reserves from 10 million to 50 million, I'm not sure whether it's consistent to include. The, the OPEB. OPEB fund is part of that growth in reserves. It's a little different from the other reserves. Just a thought. It's a little different. You're right. Um, at some point in time, hopefully, we'll begin drawing down some of these once it gets to the point that we're able to do that. As well as the pension fund when it reaches full funding, and that's yeah. probably got $100, 200000000 million. I don't know how yes. much, but a lot. Yeah. Right. Okay. David Kaufman, Precinct 3. Um, with... Uh, the recent uh, bond rate uh, uh, interest rates in the sub 1% area, I wondered what the uh, impact of that, either plus or minus on our financial situation was going to be. It clearly means that uh, over the short term we can borrow at a very adv advantageous rate, but it also means that our investment in these reserve balances is going to return a little bit less unless they're uh, very long-term somehow. Yes, yeah, so we actually do pretty good on some of our, so we're restricted on what we can invest in. In some of our investments, specifically the OPEB, I believe, we actually, is it OPEB? Now you're talking too technical for me. It's a 46D equity, she just said. That's too technical for me. Um, the others are like you know, lower, like okay, yeah, it's the, the, the Yes, okay. So the OPEB is allowed to be, is, has more flexibility. And we actually earned, do you recall? About 18.5% interest on the OPEB fund last year. On all of the other ones, we have to use what's called the legal list on it. And so we're only allowed to invest in certain uh, items and so those are quite a bit lower but you're, you're right and so one of the things we do is when we do our uh, debt analysis each year whenever we're working through with um, the financial committees the select board and the school committee as we go through all of the budget summits we have we use uh, I think we're using four percent and sometimes four and a half percent estimated interest cost on all of our debt service projects when we do our debt service modeling and so if we go, because we're trying to be conservative when we're proposing uh, projects, and then if we go out to bid, our last bond issuance was how much? Seven. It was under 1%. It was under 1%, 0.97. So when we're able to achieve that with our AAA bond rating, it obviously makes a big difference in what actually then ends up becoming our debt service cost. Here from Baskin, Precinct 2. Um, a 
couple of slides back, you had a bullet, I think it was the second bullet down, under the heading of bicycling, transportation, and so on, and you had a number on that of like uh, $3.5 million. And so I'm just wondering if um, somewhere. Yeah, the, uh, it's, the one it's you there. Had a, you had a, a there, number right on there. it. Yeah. Three point so, eight. And then prior to that, under the same heading, you um, were, it, it was uh, trans, uh, sidewalk construction. Yes. Um, so is that $3.8 million there? Is that just for that? the sidewalk construction from the prior slide? No, no, there's a lot of other things that fall into that. Um, road projects, um, we, we budget, so um, for our road maintenance, we receive a certain amount of money each year through the Chapter 90 program from the Commonwealth. And uh, Lexington has done studies over the years, what it would really take for us to replace roads at the end of their useful life. And what we receive under Chapter 90 is not sufficient, so we budget, um, I would have to look it up to get the exact number. Two, it's, it's in the $2 million range of that is just um, street maintenance, additional street ma maintenance costs on top of that. And then we do have a number of other sidewalk improvement projects around town where we do things like improve the handicapped um, access ramps at the intersections as well as some signalization work and some bicycle um, lane striping that we'll be doing that is all incorporated into that number. So it's a lot of different projects. Thank you. Andre Radulescu Banu, Precinct 8. So side, sidewalk question. Uh, last town meeting, we approved the construction funds for Hill Street sidewalk, but I don't see any work being started and I'm concerned about it. That uh, project is currently under design. It'll be out to bid, and we're hoping to do the work this construction season. Um, and um, waiting one year, does that increase construction costs? Would you need to come back for a supplementary appropriation for it? No, so, so town meeting approval, the money becomes available July 1. That is not a good time to bid any of those types of construction projects. So we develop the plans and specs, get those bid out over the winter uh, into the uh, early spring, and then have them ready for that construction season that's coming up. So it, it, it did not affect the cost. Okay. Uh, thank you for that answer. Um, same question about center streetscapes. We approved construction costs, but we're not seeing any work being done in the center. Yeah, uh, it's pretty much a similar type of um, situation, although that is a lot more um, complex design work. And so the approved um, appropriation from town meeting was to do the final design, bring it from like 25% design through 100% design and put it out to bid. And so we anticipate getting um, the design completed, I think, in the fall of um, 20. And um, during the period from about now until the end of this year, we'll begin probably later this year when we have a, a pretty solid um, design. We'll begin meeting with the businesses in the center. We'll be looking to put it out to bid, and construction will start in after Patriots Day, after it's Patriots Day in 2021. And it, it's plan to be wrapped up before Patriots Day in 2024, or by the end of 2024, but hopefully. Okay. Uh, Bridger McGaugh, Precinct 6. Um, again, on sidewalks, the, there was a lot of work done on uh, Lowell Street between East and Woburn, um, but there's a section, there's another there's talk in here about improvement of the Lowell East Street intersection, but there's still a section of sidewalk that's missing from uh, on on Lowell Street. Yeah, so the, those will be like addressed with the appropriate. So the the regular sidewalk uh, rehabilitation rehab um, replacement that's that standing article for I think it's eight hundred thousand. Yeah. So they do the amount of work that can be done with that funding and they pick up any pieces of that in the following uh, fiscal year's funding. So that's, it was simply, there were a lot of projects that went on, so they will get back to finish that um, once that funding becomes available. So the students that are now definitely staying in Fisk can walk to East Street and cross it. Yes. There. Awesome, thank you. Um, 
I, uh, question about, uh, I didn't see any capital improvements for police vehicles in here. I didn't know if that was not a capital expense. It's, it's not considered a capital expense. It's in the operating budget. It's in the operating yeah. budget? So I, I didn't see a call out for it in the, like, vehicles. I don't think it is. It's, it's, not, it's not broken out separately. It's just in the operating expense. Of the so like supplies? Department. Yeah. It's like 10 pens, it's, 10 it's cars. Been, it's been sort of considered that, yes, in the overall grand scheme of it, because we replace a certain number of cars every year. Okay. So it's been built into the police budget because we're not going to not replace those cars every year. We need to replace a certain number each year. Uh, if you go under the law enforcement section of the Brown book, small which is on capital. page VI, there's a line for small capital in there. Um, for fiscal 21, it's 238,889. It's included in that line item. So you, you don't have the Brown book. No, I'm holding the different books, but yeah. that's, <laughs> okay. that's great. But it, is so small capital mean like five? Like how much is a car? Uh, oh. So it would. It depends on the yeah. vehicle that we're I buying. <laughs> some are SUVs and some are... Right. Um, and, and we do have, once we have a sustainability director, we may begin looking at some electric vehicles too. So Excellent. It, it varies. Okay. Um, great. Yeah. Thank you. Let me just grab my... I have one more question. Oh. Um, is there a... Ex uh, interest in a, a revenue sharing model for the firing range? There is. Um, we're actually working with uh, the Massachusetts Criminal Justice Training Council and uh, MAPC. The Mass Criminal Justice Training Council is who operates the police academies in the state yeah. and they need a place to qualify new police officers and they're looking for a place. And so they're interested in perhaps making an upfront investment as well as an ongoing um, operating contribution. And then we have a number of police departments around us that right now send their officers on their twice yearly qualifying to uh, either Devon's or to some other facility, end up, end up having to pay quite a bit to actually, because you have to pay them from the time they leave the town to the time they come back. Yep. And so we're a lot closer and uh, we do think that there will be some opportunity for that. We have requested um, MAPC, the um, Metropolitan Area Planning Council, to do a analysis of which communities around us would actually be interested in participating if we had a firing range here so that we could begin to develop some sort of a business model on what it would cost to operate. Excellent, that's great, Derek. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Uh, now, Article 24, is <clears throat> Mr. Neumeier. Thank you. I have handed out uh, to hopefully everybody that wanted it a hard copy, which is 95% of what the town clerk has up here. Um, and the most important thing is a summary of several pages. <clears throat> um, I want to talk about three things. First, what are we spending on legal? Second, what are we spending it for? And third, are there any alternatives? Let me begin with the first item. Uh, back in the beginning of time, when I was first elected to town meeting in 1989, and I looked at the budget book, I thought the answer to the first question was in light item 8120, legal expenses for the town. If you look through this book, you won't find any other place where spending money on legal is identified anywhere. Uh, when I got appointed to the Appropriations Committee, however, I found out that uh, that's not correct, that we spend 
Uh, can you move it ahead to the summary? We spend well over 100000 plus on other matters, which are legal expenses for the town, which are not uh, disclosed in the Brown Book. Uh, I assume this is an accounting uh, issue. I'm not an accountant. That's my assumption. But I have looked at how other towns are doing this a little bit, and they all follow the way Lexington does it. Uh, but on this summary, uh, the biggest item is town council. Uh, and there are some other items in here which uh, always have to be sent outside. Bond council, for example. Uh, the city of Boston sends its bond council to outside council. Um, nonetheless, this does indicate that we're spending over half a million dollars uh, on legal for outside council. Now, I did put in at the bottom of this school uh, to indicate what we're spending on the school budget. That's not the subject of this article, but it did indicate, it does indicate that uh, there is a way of controlling legal expenses, which has been done very well by the former superintendent. So we're spending uh, 510,000 uh, the last three year average. Now, uh, those of you that have the handout, just look at the next page, page two, which tells you everything you need to know from page three through 13. Um, this is a summary, and she doesn't have it, so you, you can't have it. Those people watching it uh, elsewhere can't see this. But this is a summary of cases disposed of uh, by the by town council from 2010 to 2018. I had intended this to be a 10-year summary, but I, I forgot about when the town report comes out for this year, and so the last year is not included. Town council is required by the, by the bylaws to put in the town report three items, actions pending by or against the town, two, actions brought by or against the town, and three, all actions disposed of by or against the town uh, in uh, 12 months. And this summary deals with the latter category. And I'd like you to take a look at the summary in the handout, just for a little bit. You can't look up there, Norm. You gotta look at what I handed you. Uh, 62 cases were disposed of. The largest category is judgment on the pleadings or summary judgment dismissing the complaint. 23 cases disposed of there. What does that mean for you non-lawyers? That means uh, that usually a junior associate is uh, sent uh, into court and says to the judge, judge, assuming everything the plaintiff has said is correct, under the undisputed facts, this does not state a claim for which relief can be granted and the complaint must be dismissed. That's 23 of the cases, the largest category. The second largest category are agreed to dismissal or stipulation of dismissal. Now, one of the cases uh, in this uh, that was brought against the town was someone that didn't want to have his dog leashed when he walked through Willard Woods. There's a conservation regulation that says if you want to go walk through Willard Woods, you have to have a leash of the dog. This person sued the town, saying, I don't want to have a leash. Like that? Not too complicated a case, frankly. Uh, a lot of those cases, 19 of them, the plaintiff finally agrees to say, okay, I'll dismiss the case. That's the second largest category. Then we have cases settled. Uh, in nine years, 15 cases were settled. We did have five cases when I couldn't figure out what happened. Then if you look way off to the left, trials, zero. What does that mean? In nine years, town council never had to make a closing argument to a jury. Maybe I've never had to impanel a jury or cross-examine a witness. Um, that's the great bulk of the work. 
But something else I found out uh, during this process, which I never knew uh, before, it's been very educational for me, and those of you that have the handout, turn to page 14. I get an email from the clerk's office, manager's office, excuse me, saying, Dear Richard, please see the attached document of the small edit from town council, changing 8200 to 8220. Please let me know if you accept that change. And that proposed change is on page 15, and I did accept the change. I never knew that citizens' articles were sent to outside council for review to see whether some mistake had been made. I made a mistake here. But that's another thing that uh, we're spending money on. Uh, I also include a report uh, by the Legal Services Review Committee dated uh, November 18, 2006. That's a while ago, uh, but that's the most recent comprehensive report we have. And it describes, and, and the, the nature of the work hasn't changed, uh, frankly, all that much. Um, and Stephen Politi, in his addendum, which is at page 21, uh, points out that back then, the town was paying about $100,000 uh, a year uh, than each of the nearby communities which were being compared with, and that 80% of the legal work uh, was of a routine nature, which is what I'm talking about. That's what this article is about. There are some cases where you've got to go to outside counsel. For example, uh, I'm sure everyone remembers here the PCB problem that we had with Estabrook, and a decision was made to sue Monsanto. That case cannot go to in-house counsel. Now, by the way, Monsanto got summary judgment dismissing the complaint, but if you want to bring that kind of claim, you've got to go to outside counsel. That's different than Willard Woods. Um, Are there alternatives? Well, first I want to talk a little bit about the legal market. We, we, sorry. Yeah, I'm almost done. The legal market has never been more favorable to consumers of legal services now than in my lifetime. Uh, the ABA reported, and this is at pages 22 and 23, that Massachusetts is one of a handful of states where more than 50% of the lawyers are not working at legal jobs. That's not because they racked up all this money through tuition and whatever uh, to do something else. I mean, a few of them decided, well, I went to law school, but now I don't want to do uh, something else. Most of them actually wanted to have a legal job. The legal jobs are not available. We've all heard from... Uh, Let me see if I can find the page here. I can't. <laughs> it's in here somewhere. Uh, President Trump explaining how good the economy is doing and how employment is doing. Uh, the ABA put out a little piece uh, last year pointing out that for lawyers, jobs were actually less in uh, 2019 in terms of uh, growing. They had declined. Uh, finally, uh, looking at the market for legal services, uh, I attach a few ads that have appeared in the Mass Lawyers Weekly for in-house legal jobs. Um, and you can read what they require. Uh, they're in the system. Uh, City of Bedford, one of five years experience in municipal law, a whole bunch of other things. What were they going to pay? 70000 uh, to 88000 and change. Um, interestingly, that ad also said, we'll be interested in a part-time lawyer, which is another thing to think about. It's not something town media can do anything about, but it's, uh, it's something to think about. Other towns comparable in population that do this for Franklin, Milford, West, West Springfield, and Woburn. And finally, I attach a description 
of the, what the city solicitor of Woburn does or is expected to do. Peter Enrich, Precinct 4. Just a very quick question. Um, 2006 was a long time ago, and my memory is not very fresh, and I have not had the chance to refresh it, but I did chair that Legal Services Review Committee at that time. And am I correct in remembering that the thing you cite in the appendix from Steve Politi was not part of the majority report of that committee? Uh, that was a comment he made as uh, one committee member. You are correct. And the report does say interim report. You might say, well, where's the final report? Where's the next report? Uh, we're still waiting. Uh, Bob Avalone, Precinct 8. Uh, have you presented this idea to the select board, and what was their reaction, if so? I have, uh, when I got on the committee appropriation, yes, is, is the answer. And uh, when I got on the committee, the Appropriations Committee the second time, we had a meeting in 2012. And uh, we had uh, the superintendent there and the, uh, uh, the manager there and uh, members of the select board. Uh, and they thought, they said to us, it was my understanding, that we'd study us and get back to, the, uh, get back to us. Uh, I don't know what happened after that. I have since spoken with each selectman after each election to the selectman and the new town manager about this subject. And what's their reaction to it? Uh, they would think about it. Okay, thank you. Last question. Norman Cohen, Precinct 4. Uh, now, I was going to ask a few questions, which I will, but I believe the selectmen, and you were there, uh, took a vote, and I think it was zero to five, so I think you ought to uh, recognize that. I have to say, uh, in all the years that I've been involved with Lexington, I've never seen an article written the way your article is. Now, let me ask you, uh, when I looked at that article, and uh, you're going to cut the budget for legal services for Lexington, which is a Close probably to three hundred million dollar. Hundred thousand. It's not quite three hundred million. Yeah, yeah. No, you're cutting the legal budget to a uh, hundred and and from four something to one hundred and ten or something, as right. I recall. That's right. And 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 so that we're saving three hundred thousand, but you're taking one hundred thousand, and it's going to the town manager's uh, budget. Where's the other 200,000? Is that going out in the clouds or someplace? Well, that's a good question. And uh, here's my answer. When you hire outside counsel, you have to pay rent for outside counsel. All of us have rented property. You have to pay for a malpractice premium. You pay a higher rate. Uh, if we bring, uh, we have a public information officer that was hired uh, not too long ago. We didn't used to have a public information officer. But when we hired the public information officer, we didn't have to pay any rent for that. We will put the in-house counsel somewhere in the system, uh, in a building where we've already paid for it. So it might seem like I'm asking uh, one new lawyer to do, you know, three times as much work, but that's not actually correct. Uh, now, if you want to compare us to Woburn, uh, Woburn, and I think Woburn is a comparable town in the sense it's right nearby, it's it got an extra 5,000 people, but it has an in-house counsel who works for about 100,000 a year. She's been there since 2010, okay. something like that. Excuse me, could I just interrupt? Sure, you, I don't, you have these things. Uh, Woburn's a city. Most of the places that you have noticed were a city. But I have one more question. I'll have more probably at the town meeting. But first of all, if this passes, who, who appoints the town council? How, how do we get the town council, this well, person that's going to come in? I, I, I don't think that would, uh, that, that's, that would be done by the Board of Selectmen and, yeah. and well, in, your, in your, consultation your, with the manager. Well, your your uh, description says that it's going to be, uh, you have to get town meeting approval. The charter of this town is that the selectmen have the authority to appoint a town council. And my last question is, 
is this eight, more than 80% is just routine. Now, I know you're one of the great distinguished, and I say that, uh, trial lawyers, and I thank you for looking after unemployed lawyers. We call it, maybe this is a relief act, but I want to know where that came from. To look at the number of cases, do you know of all the things that the town manager just got through showing and where legal counsel is involved? Do you know how many times legal counsel had to, uh, to uh, advise the CPC, the Community Preservation Committee? Where, is this alternative facts you have, or what is it? I just look at the job description at the end of that package for the Woburn Town Council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Article 30, is it Mr. Jalil? Good evening. I'm Patricia Nelson, and I am the attorney for Dr. Jaleel, who is the petitioner, and the Muslim um, American Community Center of Lexington. The purpose of Article 30 is to correct an encroachment, a building that straddles the lot line between 344 Lowell Street and adjoining town land. This is an aerial photograph of the general area we're talking about. It shows 344 Lowell Street. You can see Lowell Street at the bottom and the Harrington School at the top left. This is 30, 344 Lowell Street. Um, and it has the blue line outlines the boundary lines for the property. The Lowell Street is at the bottom, and you can see that it's a, it's a T-shaped lot. This is an existing conditions plan of the property. Again, you can see the T-shaped lot for 34, 344 Lowell Street at the very top in the, uh, you'll see a structure and there's a line through it, and that is the encroaching structure. There are two other buildings on the site. There is an 1852 um, historic house, and there is another small barn uh, also on the lot, just to, uh, to the top and to the left of the of the house itself. Those two buildings are on the Historical Commission's restricted list. According to the Historical Commission, there was a third structure on the lot, and that third structure was a large barn which, bore, which burned in 1940, and is therefore not on the Historical Commission's restricted list. Portions of that old barn uh, have survived and were incorporated into the current structure, which is now an underground or mostly underground garage. My client's intent is to preserve and utilize the three existing buildings. In particular, they wish to use the third encroaching structure as a place of worship. Uh, unfortunately, um, about half of that the structure is located on town land. Now the town acquired the adjoining land, approximately eight acres, 
by a taking back in 1961 for recreational and other purposes. This is the encroaching structure on the left. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a portion of the foundation of the old barn uh, and the Harrington School and playground properties are in the back. This is another piece of the original barn structure. That's the, the barn or underground garage itself. You can sort of see that the property uh, drops off down at the back of the picture. Oops. This is the entrance into the underground garage. There is a retaining wall on the left. The lot line runs basically through the center of the underground garage. The lot line. Um, this retaining wall on the left also encroaches slightly onto town land. So the encroachment is a part of the building and then a part of the, uh, part of the retaining wall. So this plan shows the proposed exchange of land the mostly rectangular lot on the left is the land to be conveyed to the town. And the uh, land that it goes around the existing structure at the top is the land that, that is to be conveyed uh, by the town to my clients. The shape of the land to be conveyed uh, is determined based on its intended use. One, the need for a second means of emergency egress. Two, a 25-foot setback from the structure as required by town zoning. And three, room for the retaining wall uh, and a setback for the retaining wall as well. This, um, this was presented, I've been working with town council, uh, with the town manager, and have made presentations to the select board. The select board requested that we obtain an appraisal of the property, and I received the appraisal about an hour ago, and I will confess I haven't read through it. But we asked the appraiser to appraise the value of both of the parcels of land. The appraiser determined that the value of the land to be granted to the town is 32000 whereas the land for the, uh, to be acquired uh, by my clients and to be granted by the town is 29000 In talking with the appraiser, I believe at least to factor in that difference has to do with the topography of the lot. This is another existing conditions plan. And if I could just point out the, the topographical lines, um, you could see that the area uh, around the encroaching structure uh, is, 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 is steeply drops off, um, whereas at least a good portion of the land to be conveyed to the town is uh, fairly, fairly level and not as steep as the other land. Um, and as the appraiser told me, I think he referred to it as high and dry. And I believe that's one of the reasons why there's a difference between um, the lot to be conveyed to the town and the lot to be conveyed by the town. 
the petitioner requests the town meeting approve Article 30 for the following reasons. One, the exchange is fair to the town. It's more than fair to the town, looking at the appraiser's uh, valuations. Number two, it corrects a long-standing encroachment. Three, it will permit the Muslim Center to create a place of worship within an existing structure, away from other residences, and without substantial demolition of the existing structures. Thank you. Don McKenna, Precinct 6. Um, can you give us the name of the appraiser, the company? This was, was prepared by Appraisals Unlimited from Needham. And was that, um, at, was that requested by um, your client or by the town? That was requested by myself. Uh, at, the at the request of the select board uh, and town council. So, and then I guess um, for Mr. Malloy, um, and just for the sake of those who don't know, when I was on the board of selectmen, we implemented a policy for the um, sale of land that required three appraisals to be done. One recommended by the person um, looking to purchase one recommended by the town, and the third one to be jointly agreed to. And I'm wondering if the town has any plans to get the other two um, appraisals done prior to town meeting. No, we don't. Okay, the, Mr. Malloy's answer was no. So I have a hard time supporting this without really being, yeah, being clear. And I would ask that, um, again, that the selectmen um, engage the other two appraisers because from, you know, they do vary greatly. Thank you. I would just like to say briefly that this land is pretty useless land all around. Uh, there's a steep drop off, as I pointed out, from, from most of the land that's being conveyed. Um, and, the, um, um, and it doesn't really serve purposes to have two more expensive, uh, expensive appraisers come back and tell us that the property is, is, uh, is worth significantly more, because I don't, I don't see how that, uh, that is likely, given, given the nature of the property itself. Thank you. And uh, Article 33, Mr. Reamer. Uh, my name is Mike Reamer. I'm a Lexington property owner, and I'm the sponsor of Article 33, the Running Bamboo Control Bylaw. Uh, this bylaw, actually, this bylaw proposes to preserve and protect private and town owned property from the damaging spread of invasive running bamboo and also to protect indigenous plants threatened by running bamboo. Uh, uncontained running bamboo is currently present at a number of Lexington properties, and it's a threat to private and town-owned property, and I'll get into those issues as we get into the briefing a little bit. So I have some quotes here uh, to start the briefing. Uh, and until my property was invaded by running bamboo, I really had no idea of the impact of running bamboo and the damage it could cause. Uh, so I had to do some research myself. Uh, and I provide a couple of quotes here, which I think 
are typical examples of people like me who really had very little knowledge about the damaging impact of running bamboo before it uh, started to invade my property. Uh, so the first one is from uh, a New Jersey councilman from Emerson, New Jersey. And she said, and this is her quote, I was like, bamboo, what do you mean bamboo? I honestly never gave bamboo a thought, but as she started to look into the issue, her attitude changed. Oh my God, she remembered thinking, I don't think it affects that many people, but if it's affecting someone, it's really affecting them. Uh, so the next set of quotes is from the city of Cambridge. They did a study. They have actually passed a bamboo control law fairly recently. And this were, th th these quotes are excerpts from their study. Uh, a few quotes here. They say, it's absolutely critical that residents wanting to raise bamboo understand the risks and that a process is put in place by the city that protects neighbors in case of an infestation. Uh, butters of bamboo are committed to relentless and costly maintenance. And then finally, while complaints from city residents are isolated, the extent of legislation, legislative actions across local towns and state legislatures speaks to the extent of the property owner's concerns. These examples can serve as instructive lessons or unheeded warnings. Uh, so with that, we get into the briefing. Uh, so this slide details the key provisions of the controlled, of the proposed uh, town bylaw to control running bamboo. Uh, based on some feedback I received today from the town manager, Mr. Malloy, the DPW and Conservation Committee recommended an additional change to the con uh, bamboo control bylaw which will integrate into it prior to town meeting. Uh, the change is that in addition to requiring existing owners of bamboo to contain the bamboo on their property, uh, there will be no new running bamboo allowed to be planted in the town of Lexington. Uh, just some of the key points as indicated here. Uh, so specific requirements the bamboo owners have to contain the bamboo on their property. It cannot encroach on any other private or town-owned property. Uh, the bamboo must be properly contained. I see a, spell, a spelling error there, I'll correct. Uh, there's be best practices for containing it, seamless impermeable bar barriers. They need to be at least 36 inch below and two inch above the ground because bamboo grows like a grass. It can trench under things and also rise over uh, containment barriers, uh, and also setback requirements as well. The enforcement authority is the town manager, their designee, and there are uh, penalties that will apply for violations, as I outline here, $100 a day. Uh, for each day, the bamboo violates the bylaw, and there could be additional penalties as well uh, if the bamboo impacts town-owned properties, those would be uh, around uh, bamboo removal and barrier installation. Okay, uh, so the next couple slides are intended to provide really a high-level overview of just how invasive and damaging running bamboo can be when it is not properly planted and maintained. Uh, it's designed really to be educational based on the assumption that like me, most people are not familiar with the damaging potential of running bamboo, primarily because most landscapers will not plant it. Uh, so I mentioned here a few quotes, and I have sources for all these quotes. Uh, running bamboo is very invasive when it is uncontained. It's one of the world's most invasive plants. Once established, literally next to impossible to control, shoots up from the ground each spring, can grow up to 12 inches in one day. It reaches heights of 15 feet tall and can travel as far as 20 feet underground from its original clump each spring. And uh, the roots are as deep as three feet, so that's 20 feet from its original clump and as deep as three feet, a very dense root structure. It can travel very fast. A solitary plant can take over an entire yard and the yard next to it and next to that and so on. So it moves very fast underground. 
the next quote here requires constant trimming of any rhizomes, which are roots that climb over containment barriers. So the bamboo spreads very aggressively. It will try to go under and over barriers, so it still needs to be maintained even in a barrier. And the final quote here, running bamboo roots must not come in contact with soil outside of its containment barrier. That's just a, one of the provisions in the New York State law, uh, which uh, is, is designed to contain running bamboo. So I talked a little bit about uh, the Cambridge law uh, restricting the planting and spread of running bamboo. There are a number of other states and towns that have passed laws as well. Uh, many of the surrounding states to Massachusetts have laws restricting running bamboo. At a minimum, they restrict or prohibit the spread of the bamboo beyond the boundaries of the property owner, owner's property. They impose fines and penalties similar to what uh, the Lexington bylaw proposes. Many also require insulation practices such as setbacks and barrier requirements, or they prohibit its planting altogether. So it's very common in states around Massachusetts for there to be control laws, and even in other Massachusetts towns, there are control bylaws as well. Uh, I list here, this is a, just a partial list of states and towns. Uh, there is one correction in New Jersey. Their law did pass their state assembly, but it's in their state senate now. But in the meantime, there's over 20 municipalities that have their own bamboo restrictions in New Jersey alone. Uh, some of them which outright ban its planting. Okay, this uh, slide just indicates how difficult it is to remove running bamboo. Uh, even when the roots are cut back, they regrow quickly. Uh, they lay as deep as three feet beneath the surface. surface. Uh, we know that from our own personal experience, having tried to trench it out. Uh, removing it is a very laborious undertaking. It's, oft, it's very difficult to get out all the roots, and if you leave any roots in the soil, they quickly reconstitute themselves. Uh, as indicated here, you need to remove all the roots. Uh, they spread as much as 20 feet each spring, and they quickly reconstitute themselves. It's, it, it can take several years of hard work to eradicate a grove once it establishes itself. We've got a few cases in Lexington where we do have very large groves of bamboo uh, that are growing. Uh, and I'll get into that a little, in a little bit more detail later in the briefing. Uh, okay, again, just uh, how this, this slide just illustrates how difficult it is to remove running bamboo. The only way to truly get rid of it is it has to be trenched out. Uh, I mentioned here some uh, research that's been done on poisoning. Uh, it's very resilient, even herbicides designed to kill unwanted weeds, grass, and plants can't kill it. Uh, and according to a University of Florida study, there are currently no herbicide labels that list bamboo as a controlled species. Uh, we know from our experience that poisoning does not work uh, uh, based on the, uh, our attempts to get rid of the bamboo on our own property. And in any event, there's only so much poison you would want to put on your property. A uh, couple other items here. Uh, bamboo can cause major property damage. The city of Cambridge study uh, indicated it, it can go through foundations, sidewalks, roadways, paths, sewer systems. Uh, it's it is very damaging once it gets established. It, again, the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture referenced in the City of Cambridge study said it should not be planted near buildings and must be contained. And a U.S. Department of Agriculture 
quote, it has roots of steel, can buckle sidewalks and driveway. So it's very damaging. It's not your typical grass or plant shrub. It grows very fast and it's very damaging. Uh, okay. So the next slide details some of the locations where uncontained running bamboo is located in the town of Lexington. Uh, there is another location I'm adding to the uh, briefing that will go to town meeting at the end of March. I've got four locations here, three on this page. Uh, in every case that I'm aware of in the town of Lexington where running bamboo has been planted, it's now uncontained, so it was either installed improperly or not maintained properly, and as a result now it's, it's uncontained in every case. Uh, I know of no case where it was planted and maintained properly, which is fairly typical, unfortunately, with running bamboo. Uh, in two of the cases, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, I believe the uncontained bamboo uh, has been spreading for several years, and it's now uh, evolved into a, a fairly large grove uh, where it will be impractical to manually trench it, and the only way to remove it will be with large earth-moving equipment, probably backhoes. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm going to focus on two properties here, 165 Lowell Street. Uh, this is the property where the town meeting member association uh, bus tour is going to stop at. The bamboo here has spread from 165 Lowell Street to a couple other properties, two Whipple Road and two Wheeler Road. It's about a thousand square feet now. It's uh, about 30 feet from Whipple Road and it goes through a heavily wooded area so it's going to be impossible to remove without trenching out all the biodiversity in the, in the uh, heavily wooded area. Uh, but the property I really wanted to touch on was the property at 16 Ingleside Road. This is a, a very large grove. It uh, is along the bike path. It's about 10 feet from the bike path now. I'd estimate it's well over 2,000 square feet. It's in a wooded area. It also runs through a creek. It, at this point, based on its size, it will be impractical to contain it. Uh, it will have to be removed at some point, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, uh, and the job of removing it is going to get more time-consuming, more expensive, and it's just going to damage more biodiversity uh, if the problem is left alone, which is the case now. Uh, and in summary, uh, so... As I tried to impart, bamboo is not a typical shrub or tree or weed. It doesn't have a typical root system or grow like a typical shrub, tree, or weed. Uh, I gave some spe specific examples of how it's already threatening Lexington private and town-owned property, and as a result, I'm asking town meeting members to reach the same conclusion many adjacent states and towns have reached, and that is to pass a bylaw that will restrict the damaging impact of bamboo, of running bamboo. Uh, we can go to questions. I had a few photos here, but if we're out of time, yeah. yeah. Um, Noah Michelson, Precinct 1. Um, obviously, running bamboo um, is just the common name. Do you have a specific species name to be included in the motion for the bylaw in order for specificity in regulation and for citizens to know before they plant? Sure. Uh, for the purpose of the bylaw, we're referring to running bamboo as any plant that encroaches upon a neighboring property. Uh, there's two types of bamboo. One is running and one is clumping. Clumping bamboo is genetically incapable of spreading more than an inch or two a year. So really, if the bamboo is spreading, it has to be running bamboo. And in all the other state uh, laws and town laws that I've read, that's basically how it's characterized. And that's how it's characterized in Cambridge. If it spreads, it's running. Thank you. So with the, um, I guess this is a multi-part question. I'll try and keep it brief. Um, is the enforcement component of this retroactive or is it moving forward in the future? So. 
any, any new, you won't be able to plant any new bamboo. If you've got existing bamboo in the ground, what would have to happen is the abutter would have to remove any existing bamboo that's encroached on their property in order for this bylaw to be applicable. So in other words, bamboo that's already on their property and has encroached would not be covered by this bylaw. But if they removed the bamboo from their property and it encroached again after the bylaw passed, then it would be covered by this bylaw. Does that make sense? Um, it does. And then um, if, as you said, most people are unaware of running bamboo. So if I buy a home that has running bamboo on it and I don't know about running bamboo, am I inheriting the, responsib the responsibility for the running bamboo? Yes. You would be inheriting the responsibility to contain it on your property after the passage of this bylaw. So you would have to be responsible with it. Absolutely correct. Bob Avalone, Precinct 8. I don't understand a lot about this uh, plant. Is this something that people plant initially on their own or does it grow wild and then it just gets out of hand? No, it's not a local plant. It's, it, it's not local to New England. It has to be purchased through uh, a nursery or uh, why, why do people plan it? They like the looks of it, or you know, typically what I've seen in the town is people. Well, first of all, it's not widely planted. Most landscapers will not sell it. In fact, in New York State, their law requires sellers to provide a disclosure statement, like on a pack of cigarettes, about the damaging effects of it. But to the extent that it's planted, it tends to be planted as a privacy hedge. Uh, which is actually one of the worst things you can do because it doesn't allow for maintenance. If you plant it up, for example, against a fence, then you can't maintain it on one side. And these are some of the common mistakes I've seen in the town of Lexington and also have read online. People just don't know what they've got. Okay. If, uh, so if my neighbor plants running bamboo and it runs onto my property, and then it goes from my property to still another property, am I responsible and would I get fined for that or would the original neighbor be the one that gets fined? So you would not be responsible for the bamboo trespassing on your property from your neighbor's property, but if it trespassed from your property onto a third property, you would be responsible. So at that point, you would be responsible for containing it. All right, thank but you. of course, the original property owner, hopefully you would have already notified the town and they would have begun containment uh, initiatives because it would take some time to run through your property and get to theirs. You'd have to be proactive, in other words, to prevent that. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. No time for this one? Okay. Thank you. There'll, be, there'll be time to ask questions when it comes up for debate. Uh, Article 27, Mr. Koritz. I'm Dan Koritz. I'm the chair of the town's noise advisory committee. Um, what I have here is a very straightforward uh, proposal to limit uh, the, to amend the existing bylaws about construction noise to limit hours and days of construction. Uh, the existing uh, noise bylaws, I'll show you in a moment, is very loose. This re um, revision would further restrict the hours and days during which construction be noisy construction can be carried out. It does not include any other constraints other than hours of operation on construction activity and it was requested by the select board uh, in response to a large number of citizen complaints. Uh, the approach we followed was to survey bylaws in 20, over 20 other Massachusetts towns. Uh, we found that ours is the least restrictive of the bunch. So we simply selected and adapted provisions from those used in other towns uh, to uh, cobble together what we thought would be most practical and useful. Uh, the other towns, the local towns that we included in the, in the list are these. 
Uh, the current Lexington bylaw is at the top, italicized. You can see that it basically uh, allows, well, it allows activity uh, that creates a noise nuisance between the hours of 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. all the time, all, uh, every day of the week, including Sundays and holidays. Um, the concerns we, we had about this are, first of all, there are no times that uh, neighbors will be free of the noise. It makes no distinction between contractors and residents. Um, I'll come back to the, that. And it does not um, make any distinction between different types of construction noise. And as some of you know, what has really been most, uh, has generated the most complaints has been breaking of rock when houses are built on ledge, pneumatic hammers and so forth. I'm going to use the shorthand of non-routine equipment to refer to the equipment used to break rock simply to save space on the slides, but it means uh, pneumatic hammers and blasting primarily. Uh, the provision only affects noise that creates uh, a condition of noise nuisance across property lines. That was our original wording at the um, at the request of the town council, it's been modified slightly to be more consistent with existing, the existing bylaw. It allows longer hours for residents working on their own homes. Uh, that we put in because many residents simply can't do the work themselves outside of normal working hours. Uh, so if we restricted them in the same way we were proposing to restrict contractors, they simply couldn't do the work. And it imposes stricter limits for non-routine equipment. So this is what's in the proposal. It's really quite straightforward, though it probably would be simpler if I read it from the bottom up. Um, the third provision, which I'll come to last, is for what I'm calling non-routine equipment, breaking of rock and so forth. Um, leaving that aside, contractors are free to do this work uh, weekdays between seven and five rather than seven and eight under current law, Saturdays between nine and five rather than seven and eight under current law, and not at all on Sundays and legal holidays. Residents are, would be given an additional four hours on weekdays to allow them to work after normal working hours. They would be allowed uh, to work nine to five on Saturdays and Sundays. For these, what I'm calling non-routine equipment, we propose to limit activity to nine to five on weekdays. That's it, the summary is that we are simply uh, trying to restrict noise pollution to a smaller number of hours and days per week. David Kaufman, Precinct 3. Um, does your, is it your intent to define the non-routine equipment? Because there are many kinds of non-routine equipments. Uh, well, you have, I think, the text of the actual, uh, of the actual proposal, which I can read to you, but um, it is defined in the proposal. Uh, actually, there is a... Does it contain a list of the specific non-routine equipment is my uh, question. Blasting and the use of powered equipment used in the breaking of rock and pavement, including but not limited to hydraulic or pneumatic hammers. Okay. okay. Um, has there been any thinking about the fact that different days have different hours and uh, whether you have, you're a resident or a contractor, there's different limits and this could confuse people and people would not know exactly what the limits are? Uh, that frankly hadn't come up in discussion. I don't think it's uh, very confusing. The, the residents are simply allowed four more hours on weekdays to work. It's, that's the only, the only difference is they can work until 9 p.m. rather than 5 p.m. Okay, so I suppose residents would go on the town website where this would be posted so yes. everybody's on the same page with the exact yes. hours on the exact yes. day for the exact person? Yeah, the wording, the wording is in the bylaw. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Raul Marquez, Precinct 7. Uh, thank you for doing this. I, uh, one thing is that uh, at 7 a.m., during uh, the week, I think it's, um, it's still too early to have uh, lawn mowers and blowers and everything. Mm -hmm. Since you are at it, why don't you put it at eight? Because well, many people at seven, they are still sleeping. I, I would love to have it at eight personally. I think, I'm new to this, but I believe you can change wording when you vote on this. Is that correct? 
We yes. can make an amendment. You could, you could amend it. We left it at seven. First of all, seven is consistent with the rest of the town's ordinances. So, for instance, um, trash collection in residential neighborhoods is allowed after seven o'clock, six o'clock in non-residential neighborhoods. But also, it's very hard for contractors to get in a full day of work if they don't start at seven, because many of them have contracts that don't allow workers to work past three or 3.30. That's the case of, for instance, our DPW, when we discussed uh, noise, uh, a noise blower uh, or a leaf blower ordinance, which we hope to bring to you next time, the DPW couldn't handle a start time later than seven because of their union contract. So we left it at seven. That's uh, uh, obviously arguable, but that's why we left it at seven. Thank you. Vicki Blyer, Precinct 9. Just for purposes of specificity, uh, if I hire the kid who lives two doors down to come mow my lawn, <laughs> is he a contractor? I, I think the town council would have to answer that. I suspect the answer is yes, but I, I don't know. I don't know how the I don't know how the town bylaw defines contractor. Does the town by mm. Does the town bylaw define contractor? Is there a definition? We have to go back so and look. I'm just but saying because it'll. If, there'll be if, amendments from the floor if you don't If it does not, if the town bylaw does not, then you might want to have an amendment on the floor to make an allowance for something like that. If you can find teenagers willing to do it, I can't. But. <laughs> okay. okay. And thank you very much. And then I believe it's Article 28, finally. Hi, my name is Marta Hamo. I've been working on a, a citizen's uh, a petition with Sandra Mayo, who's sitting there, on uh, restricting uh, construction noise. This is complementary to the uh, proposal that you just heard. Okay, so the problem is uh, that demand in Lexington for housing is such that, um, Sites are being chosen that require significant uh, ledge removal. And this can lead to noise injury for residents. So before we get into what restrictions we're proposing, uh, what is noise injury? Uh, what, are the, what are the consequences of noise injury? Uh, the most obvious is hearing loss, but there's also cardi cardiovascular effects, high blood pressure, anxiety, depression, diminished concentration, sleep disturbance, tinnitus, and work productivity. That, that's just a subset of many issues that come up with the exposure, overexposure to noise. And unfortunately, a few projects in Lexington have been so loud and long that neighbors have suffered these effects. The machine in this uh, picture here is a um, hydraulic hammer mounted on a, an excavator. It's around two stories tall. Um, recent projects, these machines have rolled up and they start at seven o'clock in the morning and they go for around 10 hours. And during that time, it's almost impossible for a neighbor to be able to do anything in their own home. So, can, like if you work at home, forget it. If you try to sleep at home during the day because you have a night job or an early morning job and so forth, it's impossible. Um, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible for me to describe how bad this is, but um, you know, just imagine trying to do your taxes or something when a machine is pounding and pounding and pounding for 10 hours a day. You wouldn't be able to do it. So our proposed solution is to be proactive. One of the things we found that neighbors found during um, several of these projects is that after the fact, it's too late. 
You have a contractor who's come to a home and they're working on a project and it's going on and on and on. And nobody, there's, there's no structure in place to make any changes to that. So what we're trying to do is to deal with this up front. So we're proposing that a noise mitigation plan be required as a condition for obtaining a building permit for projects which require extensive ledge work. So you go, a contractor goes to the building department and they're looking for, to get a building permit and if they're going to be doing significant ledge work, they actually have to put a plan in place to deal with the issues and protect the, resident, the neighboring residents. So we don't, there's a huge amount of construction going on, as everybody knows, in uh, Lexington and we do not want every single contractor who's working in Lexington on every single project to have to put a noise plan in place. We only want noise plans in place for very loud, long projects. So the need for a plan will depend on the duration of the amount of ledge work that's being done. So most projects will be exempt, but projects that require more than 15 days of rock work will need a plan. So what will this plan look like? There's one essential component, which is effective noise barriers around the noise source. There's other things that people can think of to put in the plan, we're happy with that. But there have to be effective noise barriers because that's really the only significant thing that can affect the noise that people experience that neighbors experience. So I know when I originally, when we originally posted some of this on the town meeting website, people were thinking we were talking about building like highway barriers or something like that. We're not thinking about building highway barriers. We're looking at portable sound barriers, which can show up on a truck, get installed around the noise source, can be moved from one part of the site to another as needed, such things are available. Um, we, we, looking around, and we are not contractors, uh, we were able to find several off-the-shelf uh, solutions. This is one of them. This is the most photogenic one that we found. Okay. Additional provisions. If ledge is discovered after a building permit is issued, the builder will need to submit a noise plan. So. This is actually, uh, we've been talking to people, um, to contractors and so forth, and they say, well, you don't always know if there's ledge there, and then we find it later. Well, if they find it later, they have to go back and get a plan, put a plan into place, which means noise barriers. If they say, oh, well, this is only gonna be 13 days, so we don't need to put a plan in place, we don't need to have uh, noise barriers, and the, the work goes on for longer than that, they need to stop and get a noise plan, put a noise plan in place and put in their barriers. If, this is hard to believe that this could happen, but if the builder does not follow the noise plan, for instance, they don't put it in correctly and a wind blows it down or they don't put it in the right place so it doesn't adequately um, block the sound waves, um, then um, they have to stop and, and fix it. Like, this is really important. The health of the neighbors depends on it. So what we want to see is we want to see a noise plan, we want to see barriers go up, and we want to see it enforced so that contractors can't just blow it off. That's it. So I'd love to hear any questions. This is a very kind proposal. I mean, the, the fine is $50 a day to someone who's building a two and a half million dollar house. The fine is stopping work. But if he, if he blows off putting in a plan altogether, he, he's fined $50 a day. We didn't even have a fine because the fine is stopping work. The provision in the uh, 
in the proposed bylaw is that there's a work stoppage. What is the $50 then? To give some money to the town to do enforcement. So in addition to being forced to stop the work, yeah, the, 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 the he thing pays that will $50 hurt a day. the contractor okay. is stopping work. Good. They don't, won't care about the fine. The other thing the that town I, might care about the fine. The other thing that I thought was very kind was that you allowed them to you allowed them to do this for 15 days. I, there has to be trade-off. I mean, basically, we don't want to we don't want to stop every single project in town mm -hmm. that could be loud. We want to stop. I mean, look, I live next to a project that went on for around six months mm -hmm. with a pounding every single day. I could have survived if it had only been 15 days. This, uh, you, uh, basically, you have to draw the line somewhere. That's. Is there any, do you have any idea of how often people have to do that kind of thing for, let's say, 10 days? Is that something that happens it does. frequently? It does. Uh, I mean, most projects, you'll never, I mean, if you see one of these machines rolling up mm -hmm. and getting loaded off a truck or whatever, you know, just leave home for a few days. But um, it's... Uh, you don't see these at most construction projects. You wouldn't see a hydraulic hammer like that showing up at most construction projects. Most construction projects, they come in, they dig a hole, they put up their, I mean, it's all done. And before, I mean, you turn around and you come back a few days later and there's a house there. So this isn't really going to affect most construction projects. This is the big ones. Okay. Yeah. Bob Avalone, Precinct 8. I wonder if you try to work with the noise bylaw committee and maybe combine this with the other, get their support for this and maybe combine it with the other article, the other These noise article. These are completely complementary. But why not just combine them and have one article? That's not up to me. Okay. Thank you. Rena Malashevsky, Precinct 3. Do you have an estimate for what the cost of these barriers would, would be? I don't have... I haven't comparison shopped. What I did do was I got one estimate from one company, the Echo Barrier, so, which I showed you the picture yes. of. So these are available for rental, and they're also available for sale. Um, the rental, the, this is an estimate I got. I'm not a contractor sure. who's going to be negotiating and getting three bids and whatnot. Uh, it was for a four and a half foot wide panel. It was like $12 for a week, $12 per week. If you wanted to buy it, it was around $200. Thank you. So I think you could probably do better than that, but that's what I got. Yeah. Hi, Sarah Bothwell Allen, Precinct 6. Um, I was wondering how effective these barriers are at achieving the goal of protecting folks not just down the street but immediately nearby where it feels like those kinds of drillings would travel through the ground and just sort of shake your whole house and your everything Well, in you know, it's interesting um, because there are effective barriers and what we say in the uh, bylaw is that uh, it should uh, be rated to reduce uh, decibels by 10 decibels, which is significant. Um, these are... Um, this is not a contractor throwing up some plywood, which wouldn't work, which wouldn't work. In the uh, construction project that I'm most familiar with, because it was right next door to me, um, they did throw up some plywood, and it did have a surprisingly strong effect. So even a, cr even a lousy sound barrier is better than nothing but we're, request, we're requiring that you get one that's rated to reduce uh, decibels by 10. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Avram Braskin, Precinct 2. Um, so I'm, I understand the 10 decibel requirement, but I don't understand how, how that measurement works. So my, my question is, that's a good I question. question yeah. I had this question as I was looking through it. So I can see where if, if the unacceptable noise is going to be 20 decibels and you reduce it by 10, that's cutting it in half. But if the unacceptable noise is going to be 
100 decibels. How does that, I'm, I'm not quite getting how that works because I don't understand the, I, I don't hear, understand the measurement. Okay, I hear, heard people answering the question, so I was really happy about that. What, did, what do you got out there? Exponential. Yes, right, it's a logarithmic, yeah. Okay, so first of all, um, we have two, um, I won't call them requirements, but we have two goals in the, um, the bylaw. One is that the barrier be rated to reduce by 10 decibels. The second is that the, um, the noise level at the property line is, is below 85 decibels. Um, so neither of those, um, well, that's what, we, that's what we have in there and that's what we would like. Um, we are not in this, and the way we've written this up, we would like to re make a dent in the problem. I mean, basically, we want people to do something in advance so that they're not, um, basically, neighbors aren't running around like crazy trying to get some relief when this is going. So we, that's why we want a, uh, a noise mitigation plan that's put in place. And, but I think that if you're sitting or expecting everybody to be running around with a sound meter and so forth, it gets, pretty no it, it gets pretty messy. We want these guys to come up with plans that reduce, this, reduce the noise. Thank you. Thank you, and I think that <clears throat> concludes in session one. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much to town staff, Kat and Ms. Kelly and everyone else for helping us out.